Hi, I'm Lucinda. You're watching our new show, Cypherpunk's Ride of the Cyclic Hedge, with F2 Pool Lex Explorer, the crypto economy, and the macro economy. Join us. I'm afraid that we're at the end of a 90 year cycle. What are you doing here? I'm here to build the hedging machine against the cycle with my friends. For those who aren't familiar with the history of Bitcoin halving, Bitcoin is an open source money or asset. It's programmed to half its minting every four years till it reaches its cap of 21 million total supply of its own unit. The first time when it was halved, the mining rewards per block reduced to 25 BTC from 50. It leveled up the game as it changed the mining landscape, as the miners have to pull to fish for big rewards. As the arm race mining machine starts, we see the business grow into an industry. As you can see from the spike in the total computation power or hash rate here from the first two halvings, the rising network difficulty suggests a fierce competition, the era of three kingdoms of the mining industry. Today we'll talk about the democracy in mining and the crypto as an ongoing social experiment, with Wang Chun, the survivor and winner of the three kingdoms era. Jeff Garzik, the early developer who believed in but did not totally agree with Satoshi Nakamoto. Hi, Jeff Garzik, former Bitcoin core developer, uh, current uh, blockchain entrepreneur and CEO of a blockchain company and a space company. Yeah, so for myself, it's like uh, 2013, early 2013, it's like uh, uh, be before that, I, I uh, I was very different. Uh, I'm doing diff very different things like before 2013 and after that. Uh, one one thing triggered that is uh, Bitcoin, the first uh, halving and uh, also the introduction of ASIC. Before the introduction of ASIC, I operate my own mining farm, uh, uh, which has uh, about 100 GPUs. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, after uh, uh, the first generation of Avalon and uh, uh, the introduction, I can no longer uh, operate that mining farm of GPUs because, uh, uh, you know, that single machine, uh, one unit is, uh, has more hash rate than the entire, my inter entire operation. So I had no choice but to, to retire the other mining farm and uh, start a mining pool. So uh, starting in July of 2010, I was CPU mining. I was creating a block every week or so with my CPU. And it's just a, a four core uh, Intel, uh, Intel machine. But uh, there was a, a foundational person, we don't know his name, Art Fours, A-R-T-F-O-R-Z, was uh, his IRC nickname. This gentleman created the very first OpenCL kernel which is uh, what you use for GPU mining. And so within a month, August 2010, Art4s had created the first capability for GPU mining. And uh, I quickly, uh, 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 Chun uh, described his uh, GPU mine. Within a month, I had my own GPU mine as well. In uh, the uh, Northern United States in Minnesota, where it's very cold, we uh, rented some office space very cheaply. The electricity rate was a flat rate from the landlord, so we didn't have to worry about using a lot of electricity. And uh, we quickly put several racks of GP miners into uh, this vast empty space of uh, an office in Minnesota. We opened the window for ventilation because it was cold in the winter and that kept uh, the machines uh, cool through passive airflow. And uh, we were click quickly uh, minting several blocks a week in this uh, custom GPU mine from uh, a gentleman who we still don't know his name, Art Fours. And so just like uh, we don't know who Satoshi is, uh, Art Fours kicked off the GPU mining and we don't know who he is either. His identity has never been revealed. 
So uh, within a month of discovering Bitcoin, I was uh, getting into GPU mining. And at the same time, working with Satoshi, uh, Satoshi did not like all of these people emailing him and saying, here's this optimization for mining. Here's this optimization for mining. Here's this optimization for mining. Instead, he uh, wanted to remove the miner from the Bitcoin client and make it a dedicated client. And so as a result, uh, that was uh, my first external contribution to uh, mining in general was uh, I took the uh, miner out of the Bitcoin client and uh, created CPU miner, which was uh, one of the first uh, pieces of mining software. So the story starts from here. In between January to April 2013, a machine manufacturer called Avalon started to ship out the first batch of 300 Avalon A6 machine. Avalon A6 is the first specialized mining equipment. It's a tech leap for the mining business. It took until late 2012 and January 2013 for Avalon to uh, finally get to the point where they were producing chips to the extent that you could actually put it on a device, ship the device out. TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, creates a large number of computer chips all over the world for a number of different uh, manufacturers, a number of different applications. And TSMC, they, they didn't want to hear about any Bitcoin crazy mining chip thing. They had no idea what this was. They had no idea whether it was going to lead to a profit or not. Yifu flew to Taiwan, where uh, TSMC uh, has its headquarters, with a barrel full of the latest iPhones. And he uh, went around TSMC giving out the bleeding edge latest iPhone just so that these people would listen to him and eventually approve the production of the Avalon chips. You know, Satoshi's uh, original idea is like uh, one CPU, one vote. How, how do you think about that uh, uh, since the introduction of uh, GPU mining? Uh, do, do you agree that uh, Satoshi's, uh, you know, the original, like one, uh, one CPU, one vote philosophy? Um, I, I agree with the philosophy, but I don't think it's realistic. The, uh, the philosophy, uh, the original philosophy was one CPU, one vote. It was very uh, egalitarian. Everyone is equal on the network. Uh, you have a laptop, I have a laptop. We all work to secure the network. But uh, I knew, again, from my experience with uh, Linux and Red Hat, that the next step up from general programmable CPUs is already in the market. It's GPUs. And creating custom ASICs, that's already in the market as, as well. So based on my experience, it was just, uh, I do not think that Satoshi was realistic about uh, his uh, idea, maybe a little bit naive that uh, about two things. Uh, one was the one CPU, one vote, uh, which was, uh, again, it's a, a very nice philosophy. And uh, some of the other blockchains today, they're trying, for example, memory hard algorithms or different algorithms to uh, make, CP, uh, make custom chips more difficult. Uh, he had none of those protections in there so it was almost guaranteed that uh, it would go to GPU uh, and then custom ASIC. The other thing that Satoshi, uh, I feel, was not realistic about is uh, he did not think very much about mining pools. And uh, so uh, and it's a bit amusing because we're talking uh, to one of the biggest mining pools in the world. But uh, he really felt that uh, it was about uh, solo mining. And solo mining was uh, very democratic and uh, it uh, resisted a concentration of power that uh, it uh, was almost natural that as soon as uh, slush pool and some of the other private pools started banding together, that, that pretty much made uh, uh, solo mining a thing of the past. Uh, of course, I, I'm the exception 
uh, when I got my uh, Avalon Miner in January of 2013. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you mentioned Slash a little bit, but that's actually my second question. And, uh, you know, you started mining uh, in July 2010, and back then there was no mining pool, no pool mining. And uh, Slash only uh, uh, launched in late October 2010, if I remember correctly. And what's, what was your initial feed? towards uh, pool mining uh, because some 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 people back then they believe that uh, you know pool mining is bad for decentralization and bitcoin could die or is this game over uh, because of the invention of uh, pool mining what, what do you think about that what's your initial feeling um what, what, i i i'd like to be very uh rationalist very realistic and uh so uh, on one hand, I think that uh, it was less democratic. Uh, it gives the pools more weight and miners less weight. Uh, and for this reason, uh, was created P2 pool. Uh, that was another one of the early developments. If uh, the listeners are not familiar with P2 pool, that was a uh, shared decentralized pool where you would contribute a small part of mining power to a, uh, a sub network of uh, miners and uh, you would get paid a, a certain amount out of the, uh, the P to pool mined block. And that was thought to be uh, a better model than uh, the more centralized pools, but centralized pools were just easier. And so it's human nature, sadly or not sadly, to go to what is most easy. I can just point my pool uh, point my miner at uh, slush pool in those days and just forget about it. And I don't have to worry about when do I get paid. Um, variability uh, variance is a big deal in solo mining. You might get a block every day, or if you have bad luck, you uh, might get a block, uh, you know, within 10% of what your probability is to find a, uh, a block, or you might get lucky and you find a bunch of blocks and you're improbably lucky. And so that variance would lead to a wildly variable income for miners. And this was another factor that uh, drove people to pools. And so uh, it was sad from a decentralization perspective, but it was also uh, inevitable from an economic perspective that uh, people would go to pools. I hoped that uh, P to pool would uh, be one of uh, the winning entries, but that was uh, too technically complex versus uh, just going to a centralized pool. Uh, however, uh, as I like to describe decentralization, if you have multiple pools and you can easily switch among multiple pools, then that's also a form of decentralization. And so if uh, one pool is behaving badly, it is very, very low cost for the miners to just point at a different endpoint and uh, start using another pool. And so while uh, I was a bit sad at the loss of decentralization, it, at the same time, we saw the development of uh, pools and that was a new decentralized landscape. Of course, we can go through the, the history of mining pools where we had a BTC Guild or a CEX uh, GHash, which at uh, times they approached 50% of uh, the mining hash power across the entire network. And that was also a uh, risk to decentralization as well. But uh, in general, it wasn't Satoshi's vision at all to have mining pools but economic rationality, it was inevitable. Yeah, so P2 pool, uh, if I remember correctly, it wasn't uh, introduced uh, until early 2012. So uh, we actually had the idea that we, because P2 pool is, uh, it's, it's like, uh, operated like its own blockchain. So, uh, but That's aside, right. Yeah, we actually had some idea like maybe we can direct our hash rate to P2 pool because the far lower hash rate and do 51% to it. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, it was a blockchain within a blockchain. Yeah, so uh, 
when did you like move your heart rate from uh, solo mining to uh, to to pool mining? Uh, were you like uh, uh, straight away from like a, a launch of a slash, or did you wait and see for some time until you switch your uh, solo mine solo mining operations? Well, we went to uh, we waited a while. Um, the, the GPU mining operation in Minnesota that I described that uh, I was involved in, um, that was, uh, it was about solo mining and uh, whenever the, the difficulty would increase, we would just add more miners. And uh, we continued solo mining until uh, it got to the point where uh, variance was uh, above a week, above seven days to uh, find a block. And uh, as you know, uh, every uh, two weeks, there's a, uh, or, or every two weeks worth of blocks, there's a difficulty retargeting where uh, the Bitcoin network uh, self-balances related to the mining hash rate. And uh, if you're only finding one block a week and you have bad luck, then you might not find a block at all until the next difficulty retarget at which point it's even harder to find a block. And so it uh, became uh, an economic issue with solo mining where we might not find a block before the next difficulty retarget if we have bad luck. And so at that point, uh, we had to switch to uh, pooled mining. Otherwise, we uh, might not uh, get paid at all. Yeah, so... Uh... When, when uh, you know, uh, Butterfly seems an uh, earlier uh, uh, player than uh, later like, people like NG Zhang. So uh, I, I remember I put up my first order uh, Butterfly SC uh, FPGA unit back in June 2011. And I didn't receive my first unit until April, the second year. And uh, mm, uh, when did uh, NG Zhang get into your site? Uh, and uh, what's your story? Like, uh, you know, uh, you know, NG Zhang, before he invested into uh, ASIC, uh, there was a project called uh, uh, I I Icarus. Uh, that, that's his first, first project. Did you, when, when did you start to follow up what, what, what's going on there? And uh, anything related well, to well, just as a yeah, just as a miner, I was following every single uh, effort um, for until uh, 2015. I think I made a point of buying one of every miner uh, that I could find. So uh, a Coin Terra, a KNC, a Butterfly Labs, an Avalon. Uh, you mentioned Butterfly Labs. Uh, there was quite a bit of controversy with uh, Butterfly Labs and uh, the pre-sales model. Butterfly Labs, a leader in making FPGA before 2012, announced the plan for an ASIC machine in that June, but could not deliver. Avalon couldn't wait and jumped into making an ASIC on their own. The story ends with 20,000 complaints from all over the world arrived at U.S. Federal Trade Committee by December 2013, and they shut Butterfly Labs down the next year. I remember uh, myself, uh, Gavin Andreessen, uh, some of the early uh, Bitcoin developers, we would warn against that and say that there's, there's a lot of risk here. Jeff separated the talking around Bitcoin release out of the origin forum Bitcoin.org as he registered BitcoinTalk.org. That's where he watched Avalon creating the sales process, saw the hardware developed, and the mining pools emerged. Sounds like the whole business model description is pretty wild. Everybody in the field has to deal with the risk that you wouldn't really, you really see in a normal commercial activity. Why, why is that? Well, uh, it, uh, it makes a lot of sense if you know how uh, chips are produced. And the way you do this is you have to put up a large amount of money, several million dollars, in order to receive a run of chips. And then you have to pick and place, which is uh, put the chips on computer boards and then put those boards in a box and test those devices. So for hardware manufacturers, you have to put up literally millions of dollars 
of upfront money in order to have one miner. And so you uh, have, uh, there's something uh, called a shuttle run where you can get a slice of a wafer and a wafer is say a thousand chips on a, a big circular silicon disc. And uh, that cuts your cost down to say $500,000 US or a million dollars US versus having to put up five or $10 million. But at, uh, at the time, the basic business model is you need much money up front in order to even produce one device. And so the way that works economically, you have two options as a business person. Uh, option number one is you get VC money, venture capital, and your venture capital pays for your first run of devices. And then your devices, you sell those, you make a profit, and then you can make more devices. That's path number one. Path number two is you collect pre-sales money from retail buyers, your customers, and you collect this money into a big pool and you give millions of dollars to the chip fab and then you can make your mining devices. Butterfly Fly Labs and uh, ND John, they both uh, you know, initially start from FPG design and uh, FP, FPG sale. But uh, uh, Butterfly Labs, uh, they make an announcement, the announcement uh, if I remember correctly, is in June 2012. But uh, uh, it didn't uh, uh, take uh, four more months, I think, uh, when Andy John announced his own project of Avalon. And uh, uh, do, when did you start to recognize like uh, Butterfly will fail, but uh, Andy John will become a re reality? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's very subjective. You just uh, uh, read people. Is uh, Butterfly Labs was very promotional. They were making lots of promises. And uh, uh, Avalon, they uh, just were, they, they very little words and big action. Whereas uh, Butterfly was many words and less action. And so it's uh, something where we watched uh, the technical development. It was uh, very clear that NG Chong was uh, skilled at FPGAs. And again, my experience with uh, Red Hat and Linux. I already knew uh, FPGAs. I'd, I'd even uh, programmed them myself uh, before, well before Bitcoin ever existed. And so it was very clear that uh, he had the technical capability. But uh, we, if you know chips, then you also know that uh, Shenzhen and that area, very skilled at making computer chips already, he was in the heart of the Shenzhen area, if I remember correctly. And so it was very clear that he could just walk down the street and uh, go to a pick and place assembly. He could uh, source parts very locally. And uh, China was already a, a chip powerhouse uh, in those days. And it was clear that uh, he just most likely had better access. You were the first uh, uh, person to receive the real Avalon uh, mining, mining ASICs. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I remember that uh, on Bitcoin Talk, uh, even after two months, you receive your first unit, still some people like name the, the, the machines like fraud, uh, a scam. And uh, if I were you, probably I will just laugh at those people. What, what, what uh, yeah, what your feeling after like, uh, you, you, you mine with your machine for one month, two months, still see people like uh, name them like scam. Well, uh, you know, I could look at my Bitcoin wallet and see the solo mine blocks. And, uh, you know, that's, that's all the proof you need. You have the hard proof that my miner is actually producing blocks. Um, people have uh, always been suspicious in the Bitcoin community. And I think that's very healthy. I, uh, you know, grew up uh, in the sort of American culture of question authority, uh, don't believe, wait for proof, um, that type of culture. And uh, Bitcoin culture was, uh, was very similar, is don't believe, uh, you know, look for proof, question. And uh, so inevitably, some people just, they'll never believe. 
and they'll they'll say, oh, he he got paid to to open a box and pretend that he got something and stuff like that. But uh, you know, to me, it was uh, solo mining on the Bitcoin network, and that was all the proof that I had. And uh, I I didn't really care what other people's opinions were. That that probably what uh, don't trust uh, verify me, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, recently, uh, Andrew Chan's company got listed uh, as a public company in New York uh, Exchange. And uh, what, what's your feeling like after so many years? Well, I, I'm very happy that he continues to have success. If uh, uh, to to be blunt, the mining hardware space is uh, littered with a trail of failed companies. And uh, to have success in a uh, very difficult industry is, uh, I think, something to be applauded. Um, there, there's, uh, you know, you, you go to China, especially, you hear all the dirty tricks of this miner versus this miner versus uh, this, that, and the other. And uh, to survive in uh, what is called a commoditized hardware environment where anyone, and this is, this is the brilliance of Satoshi, right? He created a well-known algorithm and the, the entry point into mining hardware, anyone can join. You just have to be able to produce chips, but it's produced chips to a well-known algorithm. You don't have to, for example, say, Mr. Government, will you give me a license to produce Bitcoin? You don't have to do that. It is permissionless entry into the mining hardware space. And so with, uh, as I mentioned, some of the earlier names, I, I did own a Butterfly Labs unit. I owned a uh, Cointerra unit. I owned a KNC miner unit. And uh, all of these companies are now out of business. And uh, you have a new uh, set of uh, businesses such as InnoSilicon, that uh, recently joined the mining space. Uh, you have uh, Bitmain and uh, Canaan who are uh, very big in the mining space. It's very, very competitive. And uh, to be able to survive that uh, harsh uh, tiger filled business environment is uh, I think something uh, to be uh, applauded. So, uh... Some 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 people think Bitcoin has cheats from uh, innovation and evolving. And uh, uh, do do you feel uh, do you agree with this statement? And do you believe that evolving or say, the further development is necessary for Bitcoin? Well, there there's a lot of uh, different directions you can go with that question. Is uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Bitcoin can. Uh, literally, it will survive another hundred years if it has zero software changes. So uh, you don't need continual development to just keep producing blocks and keep uh, working on uh, the mining. There's a, a uh, very well-known Bitcoin developer, Luke Jr., who uh, uh, famously advocates that we should put less data into the Bitcoin network, uh, smaller blocks, even uh, than uh, what has been uh, previously discussed in past years, uh, less transactions per second. And uh, as a theoretical exercise, as we can demonstrate that Bitcoin will survive and people will just build on top of this, this so-called layer two, the lightning network, but also uh, other uh, ways of uh, uh, transmitting value. Uh, as an example, uh, one of my uh, engineers at Block created something called QuickBit, which is a way to share private keys and pieces, shards of private keys, so that you can transfer a Bitcoin without putting a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain itself. So there are a number of technical solutions which you can build on top of the Bitcoin backbone, such that no matter whether we receive a lot of development and a lot of improvement or zero development or somewhere in between, there's always that case where Bitcoin will keep going 
and uh, Bitcoin will continue to be as secure as it is today. Uh, there's another proposal called extension blocks, which uh, adds new data on top of that base layer, similar to how Lightning adds uh, new data on top of that base layer. Um, so there were, there were always three success paths uh, for Bitcoin. Number one is uh, no, ch no changes to the software for the next 100 years and people build on top of it, it works. It's a self-balancing, self-adjusting algorithm. The uh, second case is where we are today. We've uh, added new features such as uh, two years ago, SegWit and some other features since then. And uh, it's kind of a low level of innovation, but it's not zero. And then there's uh, sort of the Ethereum model, which is a higher level of innovation, but it's also a higher level of controversy, right? Is uh, the more people can change Bitcoin, the higher risk it can be with each change. So each change introduces an element of risk because you're changing how everyone agrees on the network, the consensus that each Bitcoin node uses to coordinate with each other. And so I, I don't agree or disagree with that statement. I just think it's a, a very complex picture, but I've always said that uh, Bitcoin is like a biological organism. Bitcoin evolves over time as new people join, new people add ideas, old people disagree with those ideas. And it's a very, very organic Darwinian natural process that it evolves. But uh, you know, even if there were zero changes in the next hundred years, Bitcoin will still be resilient, it'll still be anti-fragile, and it'll still work. What prompted Jeff to start coding the whole economy on the blockchain layers was not the trading price of BTC. It was the vision from a sci-fi game, The Shadowrun. Uh, you know, what sort of decentralized systems you can build on top of Bitcoin, uh, that's always been my interest. I love science fiction. That's how I found Bitcoin in general, was I wanted to create these virtual nations, these decentralized societies. Um, I uh, read this uh, fiction called Shadowrun. It's uh, like a D&D &D game, and it turned into fiction novels. And it talks about having a, uh, a little like a USB stick, but USB sticks didn't exist in 1992, a USB stick which has digital currency on it. And I can just hand you this stick and I just handed you a million dollars. And it's all just a little computer file that uh, is transferred from one person to another. This was fiction when I was uh, in university in 1992 and Bitcoin made it real. So this was uh, the, you know, the, the reason why I got into Bitcoin it was not about money. It was not even about engineering. It was about the new decentralized societies that uh, we can build with currencies like Bitcoin. You can't build a virtual nation, which is something that the concept has only existed in books until now. You can't build a virtual nation until you have a virtual currency. And the, the digital dollar, the... Uh, uh, David Chom and his currency and some of the pre-Bitcoin digital currencies, none of them were decentralized. Bitcoin was the first decentralized currency truly uh, free from a freedom perspective. And that's why I got involved in Bitcoin. And that's what I, I hope to see in the next decade is uh, virtual nations is uh, free people using free currencies. As, as we used to say in open source, free as in free speech, not as in free beer. That's, yeah. Uh, I, I only tweeted, uh, I think, uh, last month that uh, I believe that ethnic uh, nations should, uh, should be deprecated. Uh, maybe not within next decade, but uh, hopefully within a few centuries. 
and uh, uh, Okay, so sorry, I I give my time to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, anything realistic uh, besides the wild wild fantasy dreams? Like, I love that part too. Of besides the sci-fi you you read, what what's some what's something you're thinking? Like, it's practical already, or just close to that? Building the ideal work you want. Well, it's it's a it's a slow process. Uh, for example, I like to use the example of uh, when can I put buy a house with a thirty year mortgage and use virtual currency, smart contracts, and these other things. We're not there yet. We need uh, you know I I can't trust that. Uh, no offense to all the Ethereum fans, I can't trust that Ethereum will be here thirty years from now. I can't trust that I, if I have a contract that uh, the Ethereum price won't go up and down. So this is why we have stable coins. But stable coins, first we had to have the virtual currency, then we had to have payment systems, then we had to have stable payment systems. Now mm -hmm. the next thing that needs to be developed is privacy. So we need uh, private stable coins so that uh, I am not broadcasting every single transaction of my life to everyone in the entire world. There's, uh, you know, there are good aspects of transparency, but uh, there are bad aspects to transparency as well. If we want Apple and Samsung to use a payment method, they do not want to give competitive information out to the entire world and to their competitor so they would rather use a digital dollar versus a blockchain dollar because of that lack of privacy. And so the next step in that, that truly virtual world is uh, stable privacy coins. And in order to have stable privacy, you have to have, it, this, this may sound paradoxical, you have to have that volatile currency underneath to collateralize and form the layer one system in order to build the layer two stable coin on top. Once you have stable currencies, smart contracts, uh, uh, real world uh, court resolution of contract disputes, privacy, then I can buy a house on the blockchain and feel comfortable that I can pay my payment on my loan for 30 years and this thing will still be around in 30 years when I'm when my children finish paying off uh, that house mortgage. So I like to talk about uh, mortgages and real estate because it's something that's not one month, six months or 12 months, it's 30 years. When can we trust that this technology will be around for 30 years? We're not there yet. And so we can't really build a, uh, a virtual nation yet, but we're getting there every small step of the way. We're getting closer and closer and closer to uh, what I read about in science fiction. Future, future nation shouldn't be defined by geo boundaries, you know. Uh, it's, a, so it's a virtual nation in every uh, sense of the word. That's its, that's its people and the governance model. So the that's right. Is, yeah. The governance models, uh, but it's not yet established well in Bitcoin's uh, space. But uh, we see a lot of uh, new, newer uh, cryptocurrencies actually explore this this, this region. Um, yeah, I think they're they're all uh, it's it's baby steps. I would say um, the the alternate cryptocurrencies they're all uh, governance experiments. And uh, we're still in the stage where it's uh, this guy and his five friends are, uh, you know, all block producers for a particular network, you know, and uh, that's a consortium type model. Maybe it's a decentralized consortium model, but it's still not truly decentralized. But you think, okay, here's one network. Uh, and then we have network, 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 network. If you have a hundred different networks 
and 100 different governance models that are all competing on the free market, that's another facet of decentralization as well. So uh, there's, there's a lot of ways to look at governance, but no one has gotten it right so far. No one, not Bitcoin, not Ethereum, not Tezos, not, you know, no one has gotten the governance right yet. It's all a big governance experiment. They all have aspects of decentralization excuse me, centralization. They all have uh, their own centralized aspects. Is it, uh, you know, uh, Vitalik and his friends, or is it Dan and his friends, or is it a DAO with uh, crowd governance? Uh, the DAOs, for example, are vulnerable to vote buying. So uh, if it's uh, one token, one vote on a network for governance, well, how about I get a million dollar loan and get a million tokens, vote, and then return the tokens? There's uh, something on the Ethereum network called a flash loan, where you get a loan from a capital pool, you make a trade, and then you return the loan all in the span of a single block. And it's a really interesting uh, concept, but again, with the governance and uh, decentralization, it's super easy to buy votes. And so it's not truly decentralized in the sense that uh, just whales, big, uh, big spenders, or people who are smart and can exploit the system, they have outsized, uh, they have outsized influence. So some people are trying DAOs, some people are trying what I call the chaos model. That's kind of Bitcoin. Uh, some people are trying a 21 block producers model. And, uh, you know, it's all an experiment. And that's, that's what I love about uh, the cryptocurrency world is it's a free market of governance experiments. And so who survives the free market of governance experiments will be the ones who will create these virtual nations with uh, no geographic borders. Yeah, it's almost like a social experiment. Things that have been explored in the past, but we don't really know beyond what would work like after mm, someone else represent you with the vote, like with the republics. And like on the other side, total chaos and failure, one man, one vote, right? Greek fell because of that. Is that what you're talking about? And like, there's no, no sign of like anything good right now to you. Well, well there, there's a lot of good, I believe, in innovation. I believe that uh, every experiment is a good experiment because we learn. Even from the bad examples, we learn from a bad example. Uh, so I, I'm a very strong believer in you should try. You should experiment. You may experiment and fail but we learn from that experiment. One of the uh, other experiments that people are uh, uh, trying right now is a real identity. So how can you tie a public key to a single human being and guarantee that Jeff Garzik and only Jeff Garzik is holding this key and making this vote? So uh, it's, kind of a little bit away from the usual uh, blockchain, pseudo-anonymous, anonymous, anonymous uh, ethos in nature, but that's also a solution to the governance problem of, oh, Jeff Garzik all of a sudden has one million votes on this network, which is mm -hmm. a bad thing. If you can prove that it's one human, one vote, then you can be, the, the theory goes, a little bit more fair on the governance model and you really do have 20,000 people for 20,000 votes and you get a better sampling of the crowd and what the crowd thinks if it's one person, one vote. So that's what we have in, uh, you know, uh, you know, the sci-fi term is meat space. But again, uh, human systems can be corrupted. Maybe someone uh, bribed me to vote a certain way. And that's a way to uh, corrupt governance in normal, real-world governance. Uh, governments. 
So it's all an experiment. But uh, what I view, uh, I view blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, all of these other networks as beautiful experiments. Two more questions for me. Um, one is about Bitcoin development and where do you see like your goal for vision for what Bitcoin should be in the long run? Since you mentioned, ideally you want a stable coin with privacy based on uh, backed on top of a volatility token, you said, like uh, a coin? I would, do you mean a stable coin backed by a yeah, volatility Like a stable token? coin backed by Bitcoin. Yeah, so I was just saying, so you think Bitcoin should be staying vol volatile in the long I think run? It, I think economically it has to. Bit, Bitcoin is, uh, Bitcoin economically is a limited supply. And if you have a limited, uh, it's not quite fixed, but it's, it's basically a fixed supply. And so if you have a fixed supply, the price is always variable based on demand. You will have less volatility as Bitcoin matures and more people hold Bitcoin, but you will never eliminate the volatility and so it's unlikely that Bitcoin would be a stable coin. Oh yeah, I think you do have a point here. I have to rethink this whole thing now. So Bitcoin <laughs> as a, a basic layer of this whole new economy, FinTech, right? The, the That's right. That, that is my view is that uh, Bitcoin can be that economic base layer, but right. it will always be volatile because from an economic perspective, Bitcoin itself is a limited resource. And so if in the month of July, you have high demand, then the price will go up. If you have low demand, uh, similarly, just uh, the basic laws of supply and demand with the limited currency. With, uh, as we're recording this, of course, we have coronavirus uh, going around the planet. And uh, here in America, you have uh, stocks of gold coins are completely sold out. Mm -hmm. And the gold price has been going up because of high demand and limited supply. Then Bitcoin, I feel is, as we record this, is doing the same thing. I think it, it, yesterday Bitcoin uh, was up like 8% or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's high demand against limited supply. We hope it's not the traditional bank that uh, you're dealing with here. <laughs> I mean, they have to agree, um, but they wouldn't. So it's the new type of bank and then seller of the real estate had to agree too. And then the exactly. technology needs to stay for 30 years. Uh, my, my last question, you mentioned networks, different type of uh, governance networks. And then sounds like you're not agree with um, just like what's going on in the field with um, cloud infrastructures they've been merging everything on top of one big cloud infrastructure with a few players so what we're talking about here with crypto is this uh interprobability with many many smaller networks they're not going to merge into one because some of them are like you know they are building that they are building something like that bringing these blockchain people onto this government funded projects i don't know and you see that happening in europe too they have Gaia, uh, that's not blockchain related, but they, they do have blockchain projects, but more likely tech, tech giants with cloud infrastructures or big one piece uh, monopoly, of course. You do block, uh, that's a cloud, blockchain cloud infrastructure. So what's your vision and what do you want to do? What do you want to propel? propel? Well, I, I very much believe in uh, the decentralized web and uh, it's in its infancy right now, but uh, at least here in America, we have uh, AMG, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Those mm -hmm. are the big cloud providers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know in China, you have the Tencents and Baidu's and stuff like that, that are also large uh, cloud providers. And so there's this very easy centralization what uh, blockchain offers. And I, I've been looking at, uh, for example, Filecoin, uh, mm -hmm. Storage, uh, SIA, SIA network. Excuse me. These are uh, some of the decentralized networks that I feel they're building the next cloud. 
Mm-hmm. And so uh, at Block, uh, if you'll apologize for the short commercial, uh, mm-hmm. we, we very much believe in uh, this is the best way to onboard uh, billions of people onto these decentralized networks is by providing these gateways over to a new network that provides the same thing as cloud, but in a decentralized way. Now, right now, if we're being honest, again, it's in its infancy. I cannot trust uh, billions of dollars worth of personal corporate data with any of these networks yet. But Mm -hmm. just like that science fiction future that we're working towards in terms of virtual nations, at Block, we're working towards that future where eventually we will have multiple cloud vendors and also the decentralized cloud where you can really trust it to provide uh, virtual machines, just like a data center, um, petabytes of data storage, just like in a data center. And it's all private. It's all secured by uh, blockchain related currency. And it's something that you can trust will be high performance. A lot of the blockchain networks uh, right now for storage and compute, uh, they, they don't have the performance that uh, you need versus a, an Amazon. So people just go to Amazon. And uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, that's what we're working towards in part at Block with uh, Block's platform and Block Cloud is uh, trying to get people an easy API, an easy on-ramp into Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, 100 other networks across uh, the blockchain space, eventually moving towards that, uh, the, we call it the AWS of blockchains, that decentralized web that's being built. We need to be able to uh, host our websites on uh, decentralized services. We need to be able to, like we're, we're recording this on Zoom, we need to be able to use open source alternatives that automatically connect in a private way, video conferencing, and then we can communicate just like we are now, but we don't have to go through one company to get there. But again, baby steps, we're still even 10 years into blockchain. It's the early days. We've only just begun with the token, You know, we have Bitcoin and it took many, many years to uh, get that acceptance. Now we're building things on top of Bitcoin. It's going to take another two or three decades. It'll be at the end of my lifetime before we have all of these things that uh, we're building. And maybe that's a little bit pessimistic for the audience, but uh, I have a a very, very long-term vision, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years out. Okay, uh, that's all my questions, Trent. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we, we covered a lot, didn't we? That was, that was a lot. Thank you so much. Trent, no, no, Trent, do you have any questions about Bitcoin development and the forking part? Or has Jeff already talked about it? I, 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 think, I, I think I'm, I'm all good. Yeah. You're good? I'm only okay. in, yeah, yeah, I'm only curious that how much money equipment, old money equipment Jeff has, and maybe we can uh, do more like, uh, you know, find a butterfly and uh, open the box and, you know, <laughs> try to the video. Yeah. I want to talk about the relation between the current crashing economy uh, and where, where Bitcoin and crypto goes uh, economy wise. Um, well, uh, on the first part, I think that uh, there, you know, talk to the old miners. I, I wish we could find Art Fours. He would be uh, the best person to talk to, but I have no idea how to contact him. We haven't seen him in years. He disappeared like Satoshi disappeared. Um, the, uh, you know, talk to Slush Pool about the early days. Talk to uh, early miners. Um, you know, here's a, a trivia thing. There was a, a gentleman, William Pitkin, who uh, rented thousands of computers at Amazon in the very, very early days of CPU mining just to do some uh, CPU mining over at Amazon. He mined a ton of Bitcoin at uh, great 
personal cost. It cost him, you know, forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars U.S. Uh, a day, but he has tons of Bitcoin. So hopefully, uh, it uh, if he held on to it, it uh, really paid off to the tune of you know fifty, a hundred million dollars U.S. Uh, value today. So there are a lot of early miners that would be great to talk to and stuff like that. Um, on the uh, the economic front, yeah, I I definitely have a uh, sense that people will turn to alternative currencies. Uh, right now in the U.S., uh, there is a, a lot of money printing going on yes. to uh, to uh, fund various things and. Uh, Economically, it's a very complex picture. Um, there's a strong demand for U.S. dollars. And right. so at the present time, uh, there's, there's a so-called flight to dollars, where uh, as we record this about two months ago uh, in the big stock market crash, everybody sold everything for dollars. They sold real estate. They sold stocks. They sold bonds. They sold Bitcoin. That mm -hmm. was when Bitcoin's price went down. Mm -hmm. Everybody sold everything for dollars. At one point, the U.S. dollar was 40% above the Australian dollar, which mm -hmm. is a huge spread on the currency market, for, uh, which for 10 years or so has been relatively non-volatile. So what happens when everyone wants dollars and the U.S. is supplying dollars? Everyone's happy for a time. But two years, three years, five years out, there's the question of will the U.S. be able to reabsorb that and take those dollars back out of the economy? Or will the politicians and the central banks keep printing money? And so if uh, it takes great discipline and a lack of corruption to absorb those dollars, pay down that debt, and bring it back into the central bank. And humans, people, have a bad track record of uh, doing that. Typically, they want to keep printing money, keep inflating the currency. And this is more on the, uh, the corruption side of the scale, where if you print too much money, you become a Venezuela or an Argentina, where there's rising inflation and in a case where there is just soaring inflation, Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies will benefit massively because they are not inflationary to that extent. And so it's the big question of, will central banks take the hard task of absorbing that money and taking it out of the economy and balancing the debt to GDP ratio or will they keep printing money and inflation will uh, continue to rise. That is the case where alternative currencies that are supply limited have massive amounts of value because nobody prints more Bitcoin. The Bitcoin in inflation schedule is a nearly flat inflation schedule that's fixed, it's predictable, and uh, every four years you have this halving which decreases the uh, per block uh, monetary supply inflation. So obviously Bitcoin is going to benefit when there's massive inflation out there in the fiat currency world. Okay, this is a great topic. So, so happy to have you here uh, and talk about all these. And uh, I think we're gonna have you back in the future. Uh, I think that's true. Which yeah, happy to. Yeah. Okay, Chun, Chun. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have another call schedule in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's let's start get get the work done and then nice chatting with you guys and then okay. Bye okay. Bye. Great. Thanks for having me on. Take care. Yeah. Okay, Thank you.